Good morning, everyone. And we're going to look at weight bearing status today or weight bearing. So all of us, if you're sitting down on a chair, you're actually weight bearing on the legs of the chair and your buttocks. So weight bearing is putting weight through the limbs, the legs and the arms. So when we're standing up, of course, we're weight bearing on our feet. The purpose for um, for the purpose of PSW program, we're going to see FWB is called full weight bearing and I'm able to stand on both feet. Partial weight bearing is able to stand on a foot and able to weight bear with some assistance. And non weight bearing means exactly what it is. Basically think of me of non weight bearing as I have no feet, so I can't put any weight on there. We're gonna look at and please review your walking aids has them. Walking aids, you're going to see that there are canes and there's adjustable, non-adjustable quad canes. So you'll see non-adjustable is just like um, one stick. It doesn't have any moving parts. There is adjustable canes and then there's a quad cane which has four feet on it. All types of can have wrist straps or different handles and grips and usually they are rubber at the top. Walking aids, there's crutches. You're going to see that there are these types of crutches here that we normally see. They're called auxiliary crutches, elbow or free arm crutches or gutter crutches, they, crutches they may be called. We'll see those. Walking aids, you're going to see wheeled walkers, you're going to be standard walkers, you're going to see two wheel walkers, four wheel walkers. <clears throat> and most people right now have a rollator walker. They have seats with brakes, bags, baskets, oxygen tanks. It's right behind my face here that you can see. So walking aids, when we're sizing them, you want to make sure that they are sized to your um, put them on the ground and they're to the wrist crease when standing up, so straight down. We'll look at that when we um, get them in class. For auxiliary crutches, you must leave two to three fingers between the auxiliary or the arm put, pit and the top of the crutch. Make sure we look at safety all around, the ability of the client, the strength of the client, and the walking aid status when that is all sized and chosen. Not our job to choose this um, walking aid and really isn't our job to adjust the walking aid. However, there are times where you need, may need to if somebody has come in and messed with those walking aids. So wheelchair etiquette, when someone's in a wheelchair, please don't push them too fast. Communicate to them at eye level. Don't um, tower over them, talk down to them like a great big um, bird. Um, approach from the front. Don't just move them anywhere. Don't start moving without the permission or informing them that you're going to just move them. And I mean that even in the hallway, just getting them out of the way for safety reason. You're in control of the chair while pushing, so be aware of any safety hazards, any door frames, oncoming traffic, furniture, clutter, anything that is going to be there. And when we get into the classroom, we're going to do a wheelchair assignment. And I always encourage you to walk really fast with your um, clients so they know what that feels like and you do some other different for you. We're going to look at a transfer versus a lift. Now there's two different things. You're going to hear people say, oh, let's lift Mrs. Smith up in bed, but actually we're doing a transfer of weight. So moving from one place to another with the client assisting the movement of the ta or the task. Transfers must have some weight bearing ability to complete a transfer. So moving from one place to another with no aid from the client is a lift. So this is a lift. Let's I have a pen here. I lift it up. Sliding it along the table is a transfer. So fully dependent client is a lift and no weight bearing activity. And you have to use a mechanical lift. You're going to see these signs, <coughs> excuse me, right above each bed in your client's rooms, and it's going to tell you what kind of transfer or what kind of device to use. So the first one you're going to see is independent, unsupervised transfer. That's you and I. We get up and walk and do our own thing. Supervised independent transfer is all I am there is to do is supervise. A one-person pivot transfer, we're going to learn about. A, ma a minimum assistance transfer, we're going to learn about. We're going to see side-by-side -side transfer. 
two persons side by side. A mechanical lift, we're going to see a sit-stand lift, which is the next one right here that looks like a person standing on something, and then the Hoyer lift or the total lift device you see right behind me right here. So those are signs. A no lift policy means exactly what it says. If the client is unable to weight bear on their own, equipment must be used and it must be provided. The employer wants you and your client to be safe. So if I can't weight bear on my legs anymore, you're not gonna try to lift me. Now, when you lift our move our dummy, you're going to see, or transfer our dummy, you're going to see that he is heavy and he only weighs 98 pounds, I believe, less than 100 pounds, but he seems like he weighs a ton. That's because he's truly non-weight bearing. That's when you hear the saying dead weight. Know how to use the equipment properly. If you're not sure, make sure you ask. And many places have a policy. In Ontario or in long-term care, I have not seen any um, long-term care where someone who's non-weight bearing where you can lift them. So do not allow the excuse I didn't have time to get the equipment. Your career could be and someone could be seriously impaired if you try to lift someone. If you, and we'll talk about this more when we're looking at the safety issues, if a student, two students use a lift, a mechanical lift on their own, they will actually be suspended from school. Signs in their room or on their care pants state the type of transfer and assistance that are required. These are some these are some transfer aids you're going to see sometimes. Um, you'll see transfer boards, you'll see the gate belts or um, transfer belts, same thing, and you will see your um, transfer discs. We will try all of those in class when we get back. So this is a sign you would see above the door or above the room, you'd see a transfer board, transfer disc, transfer belt, and this is a patient handling sling, which I've never seen, but they must be. <clears throat> now, when moving someone, or you moving quickly, you're going to see the term orthostatic hypotension, or postural tension. So the definition, and if you've ever been in a hot bathtub and all of a sudden sit up, you see stars and things around, it's a drop in blood pressure when changing position from lying to sitting, sitting to standing, start to walk or exercise. So if I've been lying in bed for a long time, days and days, all of a sudden if you get me up quickly, I get dizzy and I could actually even pass out. So signs and sym symptoms are dizziness, weakness, seeing spots, fainting for a short period of time. So what do you do? You allow a minute for it to pass to see if the symptoms change and return to the original position if they don't and try again. Then of course, if they have this, you take their blood pressure, their respiratory weight, their rate, their pulse and report to your supervisor and um, your findings. Please don't ask me how, how, well, you'll ask me how I'm feeling, but don't give me any um, ideas like saying, oh, I'm so, see spots in front of my eyes because if I don't want to get out of bed and if anybody who's had any abdominal surgery um, usually doesn't want to get out of bed they just want to stay in bed um, you don't want to give me any ideas so just say to me how are you feeling and watch for orthostatic or postural hypotension hypo tension drop in tension in um, blood pressure. Prevention, PSW will be required to do the following. Supine position, you need to know what that is. That's lying on the back. Ask the client if they're okay before, they st before you start. If they aren't okay, then you take their blood pressure, pulse, and respirations. Then they go into Fowler's position, which is sitting up. Raise the head of the bed slowly to this position and ask if they're feeling all right. Take their blood pressure, temperature, or pulse and respirations if they are not. Let the client sit in this position for a little while and then see how they're feeling. Some people will actually feel nauseous. Have them sit on the side of the bed. Is the client experiencing any signs and symptoms? So just say, hey, are you okay? If not, of course, take their blood pressure, pulse, respirations. Let the client stay in this position for a short period of time. Make sure you ask, and then you have them stand up. Then say, as they stand up, feeling all right, um, and then, if not, take their blood pressure, of course, pulse and respirations, sitting and standing if they're capable. Assist them to sit in a chair, the wheelchair, or walking. If um, there's any signs and symptoms, make sure that you have a place to sit them down, otherwise they will fall down. Report all your findings. So, 
what can we do to help minimize this kind of dizzy, vomit, want a side effect. Page 448, we want to increase activity slowly, have the client do some range of motion, deep breathing, coughing exercises at the side of the bed, and then transition to walking and getting into the wheelchair slowly. That will help. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, poly, poly, poly is what they say in Tanzania. So um, very slowly. Let me, I'll continue on, I think, with falls and then we'll stop. Falls. This is a tough one because residents do fall, um, page 500 to 501. There's many reasons why people fall, but it could be because I'm weak, like headed. My bones break first and then I fall with osteoporosis, or I could have a wet floor, clutter, improper footwear, scatter mats, flooring, anything like that could cause falls. So what do you do? What do you do if a client starts to fall while you're assisting them? Well, if you can, if it's safe to do so, you'll ease them to the floor, protect the client's head. And if you're not near, do not, do not, I say that again, try to catch the client. You will injure yourself and the client. Protect their head if possible. In a facility, you'll call the nurse immediately. Don't move the client until it's examined and you may be required to document as you found the client, but the nurse will fill out um, the incident reports. If in a client's home, you'll check for signs and symptoms of a fracture, which we already know from ongoing condition. Tenderness, swelling, bruising, difficulty moving, hurt a bone, crack or pop, and pain, of course. If it's a neck or back injury, you do not move anybody. You will call 911 immediately or your supervisor. If unhurt, look at your five, page 501 on how to get somebody in home care. Home care is different. <coughs> What could happen is we could have strains from twisting to stop the fall, hip, neck, head injuries, and these injuries could affect both you and the work. So please, trying to prevent a fall could cause damage to you. So please make sure. So a falling client, examples, losing balance, tripping, natural instinct is to go and catch someone and protect their head. Intervening could interfere with um, Protective arm extensions, it's risky for both you of your client. And a collapsing client is different. It's fainting. They have crumple zones. We'll talk about those when we get into class. And the client goes down gradually, giving you time to intervene and protect their head. Um, high risk, you need to make sure that if somebody's collapsing, that they just collapse on your body. But um, if somebody is falling, think of them as a knife and you are going to let them fall. You will hurt yourself. So let me stop there for this video.